Hi, and welcome to my show. I sure hope you enjoyed uh, my show on Ronnie Spector, uh, one of the great uh, performers of our country. Uh, sadly, uh, left us, uh, but I sure enjoyed my interview with her uh, tour manager, uh, Dan Lillenfeld. Well, we're switching gears uh, tonight uh, for a very special show arranged by my dear friend Rob Baldacci. If you've ever been to Las Vegas and you Google up the top five attractions out there, <clears throat> you will see that one of the top three is the so-called Mob Museum. And uh, that museum is located in the downtown district of Las Vegas. And it contains memorabilia and artifacts and the entire history of organized crime in America and how it affected American culture, both good and bad. Well, with me tonight are two people that were heavily involved in that. If you've seen the movie Casino, if you've seen the movie Goodfellow, if you've seen Goodfellas, if you've seen the movie The Godfather, you will understand the life that these two gentlemen lived because they were right in the thick of it. Uh, with me today is Bobby Luisi and Joe, uh, pa excuse me, Paul Tanzo. Gentlemen, thank you so much oh, yeah. uh, for coming thank here. Thank you for having us. Uh, Bobby, the first question I'm going to ask you right out of the blocks is, uh, do you feel lucky to be alive? I mean, <laughs> that's what Actually, you went to that question. I do. Uh, when we came up in the 90s, there was a war on Boston. Yes. <clears throat> you know, well known. And a lot of people got killed. I lost some family members in that war. Um, yeah, I was lucky to survive it. I and, think it was God's will. Well, and, and, and Bobby, you say you lost family members. You lost your father. You lost your brother, and you lost your cousin and a dear friend. Yes. They were taken out in a uh, restaurant called the 99 Restaurant mm -hmm. in Charlestown, Massachusetts. And do you remember the, the date when that happened? The, it was October 95. And where were you on that day? Uh, actually, I was supposed to be there. You were supposed wow. to be there? I was supposed to be there with Vinny and Damien, the shooters. And uh, I had another appointment. And uh, thank God I wasn't there, and I missed that. So, Bobby, right out, this is right out of the movies. This was a setup. They knew you were, 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 that your dad was going to be there, right? No, it didn't work out like that. Uh, no. There was an altercation the night before. I see. Shooting. And Vinny and Damien came to me over it because they know how dangerous my father and my brother and that crew were, you know. So um, I told them, stay out of the north then. We'll straighten it out because I had separate crew from my father on the street. I said, we'll get it straightened out. So they went to the 99 restaurant in Charlestown to stay out of the North End, which is over the bridge. Right. And who walks in? My family. Wow. And Unbelievable. This was a shooting, of course, I yeah. assume. And were the perpetrators, were they found? Were they caught? Yes, they were. And did they serve time for that? Yeah, Damien Clemente and uh, his father, Cleo, are doing life sentences. I see. Those murders. Are, are they still there, you mean? Yes. Oh, yeah, they're still in prison. They're still there? Yep. Uh, Paul, uh, you mentioned to me that you're also from the North End. Yes. Uh, and you uh, referred to Bobby as uh, like a mentor of uh, uh, your, uh, yes. uh, your, yes. your, your buddy, oh, your pal, yes. and uh, he protected you. And you also were what is referred to as a made, made man. Yes. And how do you get to become a made man? Um, there's a ceremony, right? Uh, that's the involved. The Sopranos show that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much that, that, is that accurate? Uh, pretty much what you have to see. You yeah. Know, yeah, Bobby, okay. you know, asked, he knew I was by myself and running my own stuff at the time, and you know, I was like a lone wolf, and he dragged me in and took care of me. Yeah. He dragged me in with his crew, and yeah. we all. There was Bobby, this is the Boston crew where yes, you guys were. The Boston together. crew, right? So, Rob, how did you, Rob, how did you get, <laughs> other than the fact that your name is Baldacci? I have a vowel at the end of my name. <laughs> That's a big thing. Okay. Hey, we're all, we're related. We're yeah, uh, sure. simpatico. We're That's all. Cool That's right. That's all. It just, that's all you need to know. Well, what, what else do you need to know? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to ask. The show is over, folks. Uh, 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 Rob, when you and I went to F. Lee Bailey's memorial service in Boston, yes, yeah, uh, very proud to be there. Went with our friend Steve Schwartz, who's in the studio with us, folks. Uh, I just wanted to meet some of his clients, and apparently, one of them is sitting with us today. That would be you, Paul. Yes. You were represented by F. Lee Bailey. Ah, uh, yes. He Paul, why don't you talk, talk yeah, a little us. bit he about that? Yeah. My case pro bono. Yeah, what was the case? Uh, yeah. When I was 21 years old, I was framed for two counts of uh, murder of a drug deal uh, gone wrong. But it, that wasn't the real story behind it. The real story was more of a setup. 
and um, the people involved, you know, they were trying to shake down people and rob people for drugs or street money or whatever. They got executed, uh, pretty much massacred. I think it was some of the bodies had like 36 entry and re-entry wounds. And it was done by young guys, yeah, more or less, you know, teenagers, young teenagers. They were being bullied and scared and threatened and, uh, you know, they had enough of it at one point. They were in fear for their lives and they did what they had to do. And my first trial I got found guilty on, and I was serving a double natural life with a three to five on and no, no, what, what does that mean, a, du a double natural life? What, what's that, that means mean? life with no parole. First life with no first parole. First degree murder, yes. And you're a young boy, a young man. Uh, yeah, I was 21 when 21. I got arrested. And yes. F. Lee Bailey represents you in the first trial. No. No, his partner, Kent oh, Fishman. Yes. Okay, excuse me. So the first trial, you found guilty. Yes. Then what happens? I uh, got sentenced to the natural life and everything, and I was uh, up at uh, Walpole, uh, Cedar Junction, they call it. Uh, it was the worst um, prison at that time, had the highest murder rate. They actually the ones that made the stand-up count because a guy was dead in his cell for three days, and they kept moving the body to make it look like he was still alive. Jesus. Yeah. And, and so it was, it was Bailey, a horrible place. <laughs> F. Lee Bailey comes along and, and represents you in another trial. He, yes, he came and got me for my appeals, and he told me he waited his whole life for my case. He said he waited for this case his whole life that, um, to have an innocent man you know, on trial with a guilty man on the stand pointing fingers at people. The um, eyewitness was actually the real murderer. During the second trial, when I was found not guilty, he came in as the witness, and they changed his plea bargain from uh, excessive uh, immunity from rob, uh, accessory to rob to immunity for murder because they knew he had more to do with it than what he was saying. So once they gave him immunity to murder, he actually confessed to the crimes, and he said that makes the models, the calibers of their handguns, and the distances they were fired from, oh. the, from the victims. And when the jury heard that, they were like a gasp, and next thing you know, um, they told him, wow, if that's the truth, then we're going to try you for perjury. And he goes, oh, I changed my mind. Paul Tanzo did it. <laughs> but the jury already heard it, and the damage was done. The jury actually waited outside the courthouse, crying, waiting for me. So yeah. when the verdict is announced, yeah. not guilty, mm. what, was, what was the feeling you had? I mean, my, you my knees buckled. Your knees buckled? Yeah. And uh, tears immediately. My best friend, Tiziano, who also grew up in the North End, was in there with me that day. And, I mean, we were all in tears, and the next thing I know, me and my family walk out of the courthouse, and the jury's waiting for me, and it was like all hugs That's and kisses incredible. and everything. Yeah. Was, was your life involved in that aspect of your life? Was that over as of that moment? I mean, did you stop any involvement? With as soon as I was found not guilty, um, I stopped everything. I was engaged at the time, and I... Um, applied to go to North Bennett Street Industrial School. It's the oldest trade school on the East Coast for jewelry making. And, um, <laughs> jewelry I, making. Yeah, Ooh. and I, uh, I made some beautiful <laughs> earring actually in my I hands. like that, and I like that's that. That's actually handmade, it's got a special clasp. I, I did it differently than regular earrings. So, Paul, my friend, you went from being a made man. No, I wasn't made yet. Oh, was, you're, oh you weren't made No, yet. I was oh. uh, the most, I mean, I was like a hang around associate. Yeah, okay. Of another crew, Bobby and, and at then, the time. Then, you, then you're making jewelry afterwards. And then, well, Bobby, explain what, how you guys got together and Paul became a made man and then how you became a made man because you were proposed to be a made man uh, under the Patriarca family, yes, correct? Mm -hmm. Why don't you kind of explain the connection there and uh, how you did become a made man right. and how Paul did as well. Yeah. In the 90s, I came around. I had a good friend from East Boston. Yeah. I'm not going to say his name on the show. Okay. Uh, he was already a May guy in the Patriarca family. He proposed me in the family. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, then the war broke out really heavy in Boston. A lot of people were getting killed. Yeah. Uh, he ended up going to prison. You know, he was my guy at mm -hmm. the time. And we're still very good, close friends, like a brother. You know? Yeah. And uh, when that happened, I was having problems with the Patriarchas on the street. Mm -hmm. I had my own crew. I was making my own money. And it was getting really powerful. Mm -hmm. So at one point I decided to go to New York. And then I was led to Philadelphia. And I became a proposed man of the Philadelphia family. Right. That really doesn't happen often. Right. 
But Joey's wall was just getting over, and my wall was just getting over in Boston. Well, the wall that I was in. So everything was calming down at that point, and uh, Joey took me into the family. Joey Molino. Joey Molino, and the Philly family. First name on my book right here, Joey Molino. Go yep. ahead. Yeah. Yep. He took me in, uh, made me. Shortly after that, I became a couple. So now you got to remember, I'm a Boston guy, yeah. born and raised. Right. I'm not a Philly guy. I'm a Boston guy. So I go back as a May guy, and shortly after that, we started straightening out my crew. Yeah. So the first ceremony we had in Boston, uh, myself and another couple did that, and we took four guys in, mm -hmm. and then the next one was three. Mm -hmm. So that's how we did it. So now I got a crew up in Boston, I'm a couple regime in the Philadelphia family, and that made me a boss in Boston. Gotcha. Because I was 300 miles away from my family, right? And my crew was running the knock done. Right. And your name, you were referred to as Boston Bob. That was your name, Boston the, Bob. That's what they call me in Philly. That's what they call you in Philly. Yes, I didn't what they call a, you in Boston. I, I didn't have a nickname. In Boston. <laughs> yeah, but your name, Sir. Luigi, yeah. was well known. <laughs> yeah, because okay. of your family, your right. father, right. Uh, very well known on the street. No, so mm -hmm. and, and tell me again, what year was it your father was assassinated? I think it was October 95. I'm pretty 95. sure it was. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it was October 95. Well, um, and you, you were pretty much considered, uh, it, you're referred to in the literature about you as the, the Philly point man. So are you going back and forth between Philadelphia and Boston? Is that what you're doing uh, during that time? No, not really. I mean, I, I would go to Philly maybe twice a month, spend mm -hmm. the weekend there just to get out of Boston. Okay. Yeah. When I got away, my, one of my cousins was the active captain. Yeah. And I got away as much as I could, to be honest with you. <laughs> I love the Philly guys and hanging around down there. Yeah. Um, the first agreement I made with Joey is that Boston and Philly weren't going to intermingle business, so we didn't go over state lines. Mm -hmm. So I was running Boston under my crew the way I wanted to, and Joey was at Philly. What kind of role did the Patriarca family have when you were a Boston boss? Right. Well, they, they were in disarray. They were. And they were trying to put their family back together Yeah. Okay. at that time. So I took advantage of it, okay. to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, I could have never did this in the 80s if Raymond was around, or yeah. Jerry and Julo, or Joe Russo. Right. These are all the big names in Boston. Oh, yeah. I could have never done what I did. Yeah. I would have been with them anyway. Yeah. You know, it's just the way things out turn, it turned out in the war that I ended up with Philadelphia. Uh, Bobby, one of the, whenever anybody hears about the, the Boston mob, the Boston Mafia, the Boston Cosa Nostra. The name that comes up all the time, of course, other than Patriarch, of course, is Whitey Bulger, mm -hmm. who was found after having so many years on the run. And there is one sentence that I want to talk to you about that is in your list of people. If you Google this man's name up, they come, you know, you get, it takes 20 pages. But one of the sentences that comes up that says that at one point in time, you tried to, quote, gain control of the Whitey Bulger interests in Boston. Is that true that you... Well, let me tell you what happened. I went up and took over the guys in Somerville. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were the remnants of the Winter Hill gang. They right. were the young guys, which were my age. Mm -hmm. So I was up in Ball Square, and I took that crew under my umbrella. Mm -hmm. While I was doing that, there were some people in Somerville and Method that were with those guys and that we were grabbing them. Mm -hmm. Uh, during that time, when they were gone, we grabbed Kevin Weeks, and he was with Whitey and Stevie Fleming, mm -hmm. and we did a little business with Kevin. I actually really liked Kevin, you know, so we were just not really trying to take it from them because the Monoranos, they're all in prison. I don't agree with that. I didn't really want to take any of Whitey or Stevie stuff, but what was out there, like Stevie Fleming's son was working with me, Billy. So what was out there... I was gathering them in under my umbrella as much as I could. Now, did both of you know Whitey Bulger? Did you know him also? I didn't know him personally. But you I never met him. Get out of here. Never met him. So all the times that, you, that you're in Boston dealing with all this sort of stuff, they make this reference to you but pretty much trying to hone in on his territory, and you're saying you never actually met him. Never met him. Really? I so, met Stevie Fleming, but I never met him. Stevie Fleming was his right hand. You, you have to understand, Whitey Bulger, Whitey Bulger himself was an associate. Whitey Bulger was a bad man. 
Yes, I just was going to ask oh, you. Yeah. He's a gangster's gangster, though. Besides right. what he did, right. you can't take that away from him. And I'm, I'm not going to try to. Right. But he was an Italian. Right. He was a part of our thing. He was an associate. So we, no, no Italian ties, like his mother wasn't Italian? Or no, no, like all no, Irish. No Italian? No. All Irish. But he was, at the time, he was with the Angelo family. Okay. Him and Stevie Flemmy with yeah. Patriarca. Yeah, they were out of now, the with them. Um, gentlemen, the, 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 both of you served time. Mm -hmm. You did how many years before you were... Um, I think it was three years before they released me on bail for the murder charges. And right. Then I think I got um, bomb making, uh, explosives or something for, uh, in federal time. And then my other charges, gun charges. And yeah. What did you do total on that? Um, yeah. I don't know. So I, my whole life, a total like eight years and probably like 16 on probation. <laughs> and, and Bobby, your term was, was a sentence of 20, but you served 14. What happened, uh, right. I went to trial. Yep. Talk about that, Bob. Yeah, yeah I, I went to trial. Uh, I think it was uh, 2001, my first trial, around that date. And uh, unanimous guilty right down the line. Because everybody in Boston, they all knew who I was. It was all over the papers. Right. You know, so they just found me guilty right away. Right. So I got 235 months. I go back. Some miracle happened, and they changed the guidelines. I end up winning an appeal. I'm the first one that turned over a drug case in Boston. I guess people are still using that case now mm -hmm. because we want a trial on entrapment. So entrapment. I, I win that. We go back to trial. I think I got a 2007. I might have the. I'm not good with dates. Mm -hmm. And I lost again, but they took 47 months off. I see. Yeah. I went to 15-8. Right. Okay. And I served 13-9. 13-9. Yep. And where, where, where did you serve that? Oh, I was all over. I was really? in Fayette, New Jersey. I was in MCC when 9 in New York when 9-11 hit. When 9-11, you were, you were right there? I was right there. Wow. Oh, my God. Heard everything. The jets go on over. Jesus. Right. We were locked down for over a month. You were locked down for a month, and you don't, and you're, you're not being told what, you don't know what's going on. I mean, you, you just when you see it on the news. Well, luckily we had TVs. Yeah. And some of the guys had TV antennas, because mm -hmm. you know, the cable, everything went out when the second right. tower went down. Right. We lost our phones, everything. Mm. And uh, we were watching everything on TV. We knew everything that was happening. Right. Uh, Paul and, and Bobby, when, when you're serving time, we, we've seen, everybody that's our age has seen all the, the prison movies from mm -hmm. whatever. You, you know, when you're serving time, because they know that you were so-called made, or that you, are you any more protected than anybody else? In other words, do you, do you have any less fear while you're in prison than anybody else because of your connections? Well, you have to understand something. In prison, in federal prison, in state prisons, if you go home with a reputation, guys respect that. Okay. Okay, so going in as a boss, yeah, you know, some guys are impressed with it. I remember when I first went in, they were bringing me in uh, food, <laughs> you know, all the prisoners. <laughs> yeah. uh, Bobby, I got this. I got a radio you can use. That. You know, they're really good, really good like that. I fought a lot of prison. I'm not going to lie to you. You did, you did really? Oh yes, I did. But um, mostly, I got the respect in the units. Okay, same with you, Paul. Um, when I went in as a soldier, um. You know, I had less respect than, than Bobby from, like, all these other big mobsters and stuff like that. And uh, I got into a lot more fights. So, do you, you know, they I say that when a kid goes to school, or a tough school, the yeah. first thing you should do is go up to the toughest guy and beat him up. So, do you have to, like, protect yourself oh, all the time? Oh, yes. I actually got kicked out of um, OCC Supermax for fighting. I got into three fights in one month. And um, I got kicked out of prison. Out Did of you ever serve time in the hole or in? Yeah. The oh, I, yeah, plenty. Of, every time I get, every time really? I get into the a fight, every, every time, time in the hole, two, really? three, four months yeah. at a time. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, God. I was I, there for six months straight. Uh, I wouldn't. Um, they kept coming by and um, waking me up every day to get out of bed and make my bed. And I'm like, I'm not moving. And they call the extraction team, and then they do it again the next time I got out of the hole. And then the third time when they try to wake me up and they called the extraction team to come and get me. The extraction team said, just let him sleep, leave him alone. We're, we're done doing this. And they just left me alone. Uh, Bobby, when they discuss the things that you were doing in this part of organized crime, they list several things. One of them is bookmaking. What is, what is bookmaking for the edification of the audience? What's book, bookmaking? 
Well, we used to have offices. You know, you call it for football games, basketball games, right. hockey games, baseball games. It's all gambling. Right. So we would take the action on the phones. Okay. You know, and uh, win or lose, we'd settle up once a week with you. Okay. You know, we were hoping you lose every week. <laughs> uh, I was a terrible bookmaker, so I you, gave my why, office Why were you up. terrible? Why? Why, why, why were you terrible at it? I don't know. I just, uh, it bored me. You know, yeah. I, I was a gambler. Yeah. I was a gambler. I gambled a lot. You did? You know, I like that side of the action, not yeah. sitting and taking right. it. Right, okay. So I always had people doing that. And, uh, okay. So bookmaking is, you're basically dealing in illegal gambling. Absolutely. But there's really, quote, no victims. I mean, there's a willing participants, yes. except those who didn't pay their bills. I assume, mm-hmm. did that happen a lot, by the way? Yes. It, it happened, but yeah. not as much as you think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, most people would not be stupid enough to make a bet and tell you guys to, to right. go fly, right? <laughs> the yeah. other one is extortion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How do you define that? that? Yeah. Well, um, in the old days, they used to extort people in the neighborhood that own grocery stores yeah, right. and right. bakeries and that. Right. We didn't do that. Yeah. Um, I always felt, and we felt in the North End, that, we had a, that was our yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. And we had to protect it. Right. Did you actually help a lot of the restaurants? Yeah, we did. Uh, my thing was I would extort drug dealers, bookmakers, and loan sharks. Okay. So in other words, you say, you say to them, if you're going to do business in this uh, area, you've got to give us a piece of the action. Is that how that works? Absolutely. <laughs> but I never bothered innocent people. What about well, construction, unions? Yeah. Uh, um, any... uh, well, my extent in the union, there was a little power there, the Teamsters yeah. Union. Right. A lot of my guys were getting jobs in there. Yeah. And I had some good people that were in the unions at mm-hmm. the time. Yeah. I was able to get people jobs and, you know, certain things like that. But I never got deeper to the union and to extort them. Prostitution? I yeah. I never, never did that. Never. No oh, never got, ne- really? There were two things I wouldn't do on the street. Wow. I won't be a pimp, and I won't sell heroin. Okay. Right. So as we as we know, the theme of the movie The Godfather, which we that's, some that's people right. read is the best oh. uh, movie ever done. Absolutely. M- Marlon Brando, uh, Vito Corleone, uh, gets uh, in trouble with the other families because he says, "I'm not going to get involved with heroin." Right. And of course, we are, and the the the, the, the five families want to get into it because, and that's the whole thing that happens in Godfather Three. And you're saying that you had this, in, quote, integrity to not get involved in, in, in those, uh, those particular uh, aspects. When I, when I was coming up in the 90s, I mean, cocaine is a bad drug. Yeah. And I'm ashamed that I had anything yeah. to do with it. Yeah. You know, but I had a big cocaine business. I was selling kilos. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Even as far as Wells, Maine. And we can, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, so that was my big business. But I seen it as a social drug. Well. Heroin. Perka dance right. pills, right. oxycons. Yeah. These people need killing people. Get out, yeah. Killing yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. And people needed to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, by the function. way, uh, I was talking to an alcohol counselor one day, and we were talking about her, her job. And I and, and you know what she said to me? She said, uh, "By the way, she said, do you know one of the easiest drugs to quit is cocaine." Yeah. I mean, we see all the TV shows about uh, uh, people that you know, got hooked on it and mm-hmm. so on and so forth back, back in the you know the nineties and the early two thousands. Um, so, so um, pa- uh, pa- Paul, what, what were you doing? What, what kind of activities were you involved um, in? Growing up, I used to sell fireworks for the <laughs> mob, basically out of the playground when I was younger as a teenager. I pulled a lot of scores, I sold a lot of cocaine and pot, I ecstasy when it hit big. I think that was yes. the only pill I ever stole. Um, I, like he said, like those other things were taboo, prostitution and heroin mm-hmm. and that stuff was always taboo in our neighborhood, was and, frowned upon. And what about loan shocking? What, what's that involved, loan shocking? Well, you know, uh, there's a wide variety of people that you deal with. I made a lot of money with loan shocking. Let's say uh, you're a bus driver in the neighborhood. Right. You can't pay your rent. You need $1,000 to pay you because maybe you're a gambler, whatever the right. reason is, health problem, whatever. So you come to me, and if I knew you well, I'd give it to you for three points. So you give me $30 a week till you pay the principal back. Okay. If you weren't a friend that was five points, you gave me $50 a week on that 1000 At my peak, I had 650000 on the street. Wow. So you got that out, out there, yeah. and people paying, quote, interest on that every yeah. week. Yeah. And but a lot of the money I gave out, now to a May guy, 
if Paul, you wanted to loan shock somebody money, he come to me, I give it to him for a point. Okay. You okay. understand? So now, yes, I had 650000 on the street. I averaged about 8000 a week. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Paul, so you were making you... millions, at, uh, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. When, when we you were, were at your Between peak. the drugs and the, and the loan shock was my big thing. Yeah. So here's a stupid question. So where are you keeping all this money? Where were you keeping <laughs> well, it in a box somewhere? Well, to tell you the, sto- tell you the truth, uh, I got arrested in June of 99. Uh, in March of 1998, um, I had a spiritual experience, we'll call it, and I started going back to church. Bobby, this was before you got arrested. Yes, this that- before I got arrested. Correct. Fifteen months before. Talk about that. So I have this spiritual uh, Awakening. encounter. Yep. It wasn't away. It was an encounter. Okay. lasted over eight hours uh, with a demonic being. I seen people that I'll say had been killed in the war. We'll mm-hmm. put it that way. Um, I seen a lot of my evils. Finally, I had a call that night. I had a call. My mother had a church in East Boston. So I called the pastor, came up. My mother, everybody came up. I took the host that night. So I was sneaking to church when I was a boss, and nobody knew. Yeah. There was a May guy in my crew, Tommy Caruso. God rest his soul. God rest his soul. He passed away now. But he was coming to church, too, and he was a believer. Hmm. And he became born again. Mm-hmm. And we both became born again in that church. And, wow. Bobby... You became a a pastor. I did in Memphis, yes, I Tennessee, did. Um, and and we were running out of time. I can't believe the first half hour had gone by like in three seconds. But you actually uh, uh, had a had a broadcast yes, in, in Memphis, Channel Six in Memphis, Channel Six in Memphis, and then you told me that you had uh, 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 we, we're in a, 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 a an African American, a black church. I was in a black church, yeah. yeah. Faith Keepers Ministry. And you were the, like the, the head pastor? I mean, the, the No, no, no. Just uh, a, a period Bishop there. Coleman yeah. was my next door neighbor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He read my book, uh, God's Plan Revealed. Right. It's yes. up on Amazon yes, right now. Yes, it is. Yes. He said, Bobby, well, I was Alonzo there. He said, Alonzo, I want you to come That's and right. teach in my church. You had a different name. Alonzo Esposito was Esposito. the name. Esposito. Yes. Yeah, but, right. So you, you went under the name of Alonzo Esposito for, for, for how long in your life? From 2013. So I changed it in what, 17? Yeah, we changed okay. it together. You came down Florida and got me when yeah. we drove back. Yeah, because I was in Fort Lauderdale. I went and picked him up right away. It was 2017. I found yeah. him on Facebook. I see the picture <laughs> and I was dying because we lost track of each other. Sure. Because yeah. me moving around. So, so, so here you are, you That's two incredible. characters. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, 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 in a positive no, no, sense. I know. Uh, and you, uh, you, you, you go into witness protection, and you, and next thing you find each other on Facebook, yeah. <laughs> Twitter, whatever. Uh, that is just fascinating. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we've run out of this. We have, we've run out of time. half hour. Uh, but we're going to continue this show with me on five. I'm going to discuss uh, some of the, uh, the connections to Maine that occurred uh, back in the days uh, when uh, organized crime was uh, very big in Boston. Uh, and we're going to find out how how it affected me when we uh, have the Me on Five show. Thank you for watching this show. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Rob, thanks for being the co-host. Right, buddy. Thank you, and sir. we'll see you next month on the Dairy Runlet show. Thank you. Thank you.